his way of presenting his ideas is going to appeal with someone who has an affinity for that type of a mindset. Ah, uh, right. Yes. Yes. Who, who would like, like to know that they've got the answer um, because it's a very clarifying thing to have. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, like anybody, especially now who's just starting out and trying to figure out which way is up. Right. Like, how should I train? Who should, like, who should I pay attention to Charles Poliquin or, or Mike Menser? Like the way that he's, even the way he says that, and he's sort of, you know, puts Pollockin down it's like there's a cult of personality that some people are attracted to behind that way of, of mm-hmm. behaving presenting your ideas what's up guys welcome back to muscle minds with scott stevenson i'm scott mcnally all of our programming is brought to you by be your own bodybuilding coach go to scott's book you can get it at amazon uh, be your own bodybuilding coach the hardcover or you can go to byobbcoach.com you can get the ebook there we're also brought to you by truenutrition.com you can use our code think uh, high quality third-party tested supplements i just picked up their creatine i feel like it's a lost supplement that we all forgot about i'm getting back on it we're brought to you by Strom Sports Nutrition for those of you in the UK and supplementsource.ca for our Canadian followers. We've got some fun today, guys. We are, um, I guess this is going to be like a reaction video, isn't it, Scott? Yeah, it is. Right. We got some Mike Benson. baby. Yes. Well, kind of, but this is kind of like our opportunity to hang out with Scott Stevenson and listen to Mike Mentor talk and get Scott's reflections on what Mike has to say. You know, what are... What are the things that you agree with? What are the things that you possibly think could could be improved upon? Uh, you know, because because mm. nobody's perfect. Nobody's thoughts are perfect. But Mike Menser came up with a slew of great ideas. Um, and mm. I think from there, they've been evolved on. So I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. Do you, should we start this video right from the beginning, do you think? Or I think we could just probably dive into the middle of it or so. I don't think there's any specific yeah. spot we need. So what was this? Was a speech he gave at a university somewhere or something? Yeah, any background on this. What I don't have there? any full lecture. Yeah, just this full lecture. I don't have any background okay. on what it actually is. Sufficiently to stimulate an adaptive response in the form of a muscle mass increase. Repeating tasks that are well within your existing capacity do nothing to stimulate growth. If you can curl 100 pounds for 10 reps and all you ever try is 10, body has no reason to grow. You have to attempt tasks that are beyond your existing capacity. That's what stimulates growth. And of course, how to, how does the bodybuilding orthodoxy and exercise science have you train? Not to failure. Oh no, there's something apocalyptic. Frightening, dire. Don't train to failure. You might thro- grow a third eyeball so, or hair so, on so your pause tongue. there. Yeah, yeah. Don't train to failure. So, so there, there's an interesting notion here, and I agree with what he's saying. But the the, the context that's important because he's kind of getting into the you know volume training, don't, where you wouldn't go to failure, versus training to failure and attempting to do something that you're incapable of doing. It's almost paradoxical, really. Hmm. Um, you're try you're trying to do something you've never done before, but if you do it, you're capable of doing it, right? So maybe you're shooting hmm. for 13 reps, you've only done 10, and you only get 11 or 12. Okay, that makes sense psychologically to, you know, for some people, depending on how well they do with setting up goals, because it basically, if you if you set in your mind's eye that you're going to get 14 reps and you do that repeatedly, then you're never actually achieving what you set out to. You don't hmm. have victories. Um, Jordan pops into my head because I just saw um, a couple of videos of him. He's been popping up, and I like them, of course, where he's setting PRs. He's got numbers. And he's, he gets his numbers. The powerlifters do this all the time. They get their numbers. That's the whole point, right? So the other thing that that you can kind of counter, like, and of course, Mike's not here to you know engage in conversation with us, which would, would, would be awesome, hmm. um, is that also, you can if you do repeated efforts, each of which is within your capability, and of course, if you do them, then it's within your capability. But the stress constitutes an overload. What he's sort of it's just in that little clip that I saw, and I'm tossing in because it's sort of the point of this reaction video. I'm tossing in my thoughts as I listen, right. and thinking like, okay, what's he going to get to next? Is you if you provide a stimulus that it could then be a volume overload, so to speak. Yeah. Right. 
So if you've only ever done five sets with, like, we'll use the reps and reserve terminology, um, so you're not going to failure, and now you increase the volume to some degree, that can also constitute an overload of sorts hmm. because it's a stimulus that your body is not or your muscle or the muscle you're training has not been previously exposed to. So um, that he hasn't said that. Maybe he's going to get to that. I don't think that that's, that's where he's going with this probably, just no. kind of having an idea of what we're meant to, yeah. is what his perspective is. And I, and I agree with that um, in large part, but you do have a sliding scale in terms of number of sets, and then you have a sliding scale in terms of effort level. Yeah. And for some people, one rep shy of failure or zero reps in reserve could be plenty. You don't have to go to failure. Um, and those things are inversely related to one another as to how you can combine those in the context of pr- creating your training stimulus. Yeah. Ten yeah, I, sets with two reps shy of failure versus five sets to failure. What, yeah. what works best for one person might work better for another, less, less well for another person and vice versa. And, and I've noticed in my own training, you know, before I had gotten sick a couple of years ago, and that kind of changed everything for me, um, my ability to get closer to failure and get a lot out of that was completely different than it is today. So today I'm leaning more into volume in order to make up for mm-hmm. the fact that I can't, my sliding scale has shifted, whereas it was very, very low volume, very high intensity. Now it's kind of gone the opposite direction in order to still be mm-hmm. able to do what I love, you know, is what it comes down to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, there's quality of effort and quantity of effort and you can provide overload to a certain degree in, in both of those ways. Hmm. So, and there's more to that nuance, but let's, let's let Mike talk for a bit. We've, right. we've rambled for a while. It's dangerous. Well, Brian Johnson and I, and a bunch of te- te- at least tens of thousands of others in the world have been training to failure for 20 years It never bothered me. There's nothing wrong with training to failure. You have to train to failure to stimulate a strength and size increase. Again, this is the point. Repeating tasks. Pause, pause there. T-A-N. Yeah. So we can, I mean, now it's like, okay, pick on mic time, but a lot of, a lot of the best, the strongest people in the world, powerlifters, whose sole purpose is strength, avoid failure intentionally. Hmm. They don't try it. So you, like, th- that statement in and of itself that you have to train to failure um, for strength gains is like there's there's plenty of evidence against that. So okay. that's that you know that that that's not a completely true statement. Okay. I do think though that the the further along you get in terms of your training, if your effort levels, the one of the things that happens with training, one of the adaptations you have is that you're able to train harder. Yeah. There are things that happen. There are physiological adaptations. There are muscular adaptations. There's also psychological adaptations. So if at some point in time you're not pushing yourself psychologically and, tra- and training harder and harder, which means you're going to come closer to what an actual failure rep would be, I think you're going to your your gains are going to come to a halt unless you continue to push in that dimension as well. So for size, some some way of training hard, or some degree of effort is going to have to increase according to the law of diminishing returns, re- diminishing returns over time. Yeah. So coming closer to failure is one way that that can happen. Or if you, Jay Cutler is a great example. People go and this happened to Phil Heath when I think he trained with him for the first time. I remember back in the day. And um, there's a guy named um, Urs Kalicinski, who's a German uh, guy who has done some videos now with, with, with Jay. And Jay's still training. He's out in Vegas. He's training at the, the, the Dragon Slayer. At least he was there that one day. And, and Urs is like, oh, God, I, you know, just keeping up with Jay is tough. So, and this is like right before he's out from a show, but that was an overload because Jay trains with really short rest intervals. Hmm. So effort level is that other thing. And closer to failure is one way you can sort of quantify objectively the effort level. So anyway, before, that before we get sense. too far into it, I'll throw this question up that Scotty Davenport had. Um, okay. He said, uh, um, wouldn't you guys say that volume is – more improving neurological ability or skill in the movement, perhaps the mind muscle connection than uh, breaking down the muscle and building muscle. Um, the way I see it is maximum intensity equals muscle growth and volume equals skill. So there's purpose for both and they aren't the same, but they aren't the same thing. 
So leave that up. Don't don't yeah. let that. Um, uh, there's going to be a neurological or psychological component to adapting to any type of training to some degree, right? Um, vol- being able to handle more volume is, is going to be, without a doubt, is going to be a function of, to some degree, depends on if you're, what kind of exercise you're doing. But if you're doing like large muscle mass stuff, there's going to be some cardiovascular component. And there's going to be a very important um, uh, physiological component in terms of muscle endurance capacity. So adaptations in the muscle cells themselves. Shifts in myosin isoforms, increases in um, buffering capacity, increases in mitochondrial content too. You see this if you look across some of the studies where they where they um, examine muscle hypertrophy. Sometimes you see a dilution of the mitochondrial content, so the muscles got bigger and the mitochondrial content changed. Sometimes you see high mitochondrial content um, in in individuals who tend to um, to train with higher volume. Hmm. There was a cl- kind of a classic study that Will Kramer did many, many moons ago, and they took powerlifters and bodybuilders and they ran them through a, a high volume um, training regime. And this is like a kind of a classic piece of information that kind of gets at what Scotty's saying there. Um, and those powerlifters got destroyed because they weren't used to that. Their lactic acid levels were higher. Their their performance dropped off rep by rep. They just weren't able to hang with the with the type of training the bodybuilders are, had always already been doing. Um, but what you see in power lifters is they don't tend, some of them do because they've just got that genetic proclivity, but they, they're not trying to get as big as bodybuilders. Bodybuilders are trying to gain muscle size. Power lifters are just trying to be as strong as possible. So you don't see a lot of power lifters who have definitely have muscle hypertrophy, but their strength is tremendously better than that of, of, some bodybuilders, with obvious exceptions, Stan Efferding, Johnny Jackson, that sort of thing, Ronnie yeah. Coleman. Yeah. But you look at, like, um, there was the classic Fred Hatfield versus Tom Platt squat uh, off. Yeah. Right? Remember that? And and Hatfield, he was previously a 1,000-pound squatter, and I think he squatted, I don't know, like 800-something pounds maybe at that particular thing. And then they um, – and I think Tom squatted, like, a couple hundred less than that. I can't remember even what his max was. But then they dropped down to that 500-pound that squat. One the clapness that you know that video that is you just never gets old watching and Thomas bangs out twenty three reps with four ninety five or five hundred and like I think Hatfield got like ten something yeah. like that he got destroyed so he had tremendous neurological adaptations to strength but he didn't have the muscular endurance hmm. um, so if you're looking if you're thinking in terms of um, muscle mass obviously Tom's legs were much bigger yeah. Right, he had mu- more muscle mass to engage in a squat, but Hatfield was had had was had a much stronger squat. That's because he was able neurologically to do that lift, activate that muscle, coordinate the con- the uh, contraction. He also was probably squatting with a low bar, so he had a biomechanical advantage and that sort of thing. Hmm. But he had trained neurologically that skill um, to uh, to squat really really heavy, and then when he went down in weight. He still would have that skill ability, right? He still is is he still would have that improved efficiency in terms of doing the concentric work with limited amount of muscle mass, mm-hmm. um, just trying to do more reps with a lighter weight, and he got destroyed by Tom. And that was and the argument I think could be made and substantiated. That's probably because Tom Platts, which you see in, in many bodybuilders, especially in the older studies, probably had a lot of type one fibers. Yeah, um, that may be a maybe or smaller in size that had a good deal of, of mitochondria. He had, and Tom was known for incredible muscle endurance, mm-hmm. right? So that's, he had muscle hypertrophy that was associated with that, with that adaptation in the muscle that included the muscle endurance. So that was not a neurological thing with Tom. Hatfield had the neurological adaptation, but he, he didn't have the, he had, but he had horrible muscle and, and Hatfield. I know this from, well, I've heard it various places, but I, I know this from a guy, um, uh, Rock Gullickson was his name. He was a strength coach at the University of Texas when I was there, and he competed a couple times with Hatfield. And Hatfield used to smoke backstage, like behind behind the curtain, where he'd go out to squat because he was totally addicted to cigarettes. Wow! Right? No kidding. Yeah, he was literally smoke. But it doesn't matter. You're just doing like he's under the you know ten seconds. Yeah. Pick it up, get set up, do the thing. It's not like he's going to run out of oxygen in those ten seconds. Yeah, but. That was probably one of the things that limited him too for that squat. He probably got to where like, holy shit, he gassed out, you know, after six reps. Yeah, yeah. Right? 
So there's neurological and you can't really separate them out. But I would I would think that volume is going to be a matter more. Some of it's psychological, just persevering through that, but more a matter of especially if you do that, the adaptation that you're going to see, especially in someone who's got a really strong mindset anyway, is as they get better, if they've never trained that way, that's going to be a physiological, not really a neurological adaptation. Yeah. There can be some neurological shifts in activation patterns and synchronization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I would, I would wager more kind of in the opposite of what's, what Scotty's saying there, but there's truth to what he says too, because it's not one or the other. It's not black or white. Like, like most, most things in bodybuilding. That makes sense. SKS repeating tasks that are well within your existing capacity capacity do nothing to stimulate because you can already do it. Your body already has the capacity to curl a hundred pounds for 10 reps. It's only when you try that impossible 11th rep that you stress the existing capacity, you stress or endanger the existing reserve, and the body seeks to protect the reserve by enlarging upon its existing capacity so that no longer will that 11th rep seem like a threat. Did you follow that? Okay, thank you. I can leave right now. I feel fulfilled. <laughs> Carrying a set to the point where you are forced Can you pause, to utilize. Scott? Sorry, I muted myself. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was I was I muted accidentally. Um, yeah. So I wonder. It would be interesting to see. Is rather than just digging in and um, kind of dissecting his comment, it would be interesting to see what he would think about some of the higher rep studies that we now have mm. substantial evidence for. You know, like okay. the current state of the research. Yeah. Um, I know that from, I got the sense that he was more of. Um, uh, you know, he, he more of a logical thinker on, on, on Rand. I think that's how you say your name. Anne Rand, Ayn yeah. Rand. Um, he used to quote from her various things. I don't think he actually read the exercise science that was available at that time. Okay. He just sort of thought through these things logically. Yeah. But it'd be interesting to see what he thought of the studies. And there are flaws there, of course, or, or issues and that most of them are with newbies, not with trained individuals hmm. of the high reps, you know, 30, 40, 50% of a one rep max versus 80% of a one rep max training and you get equal growth. Hmm. So there's, there's something there. Um, and if he would, what he would say to the fact that what happens if we train light and then take things to failure, Yeah, I'm guessing he would probably say it's the, it's bringing things close to failure, at least with that volume I'm doing. Um, I don't think this will get out in time, but probably about when you're, it'd be probably just after, um, you get this or just before you get this, this video out on YouTube, I'm doing a talk up in Tampa, um, the excellence cartel. It's the PEC seven. Uh, what do they call it? What's PEC it's something excellence cartel. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my talk is on unraveling the mystery of volume sets, reps or something like that. Okay. Exactly what I've titled it, but it's about sort of trying to figure out what the heck is going on here in terms of muscle growth and hypertrophy, um, because you've got these studies, which is, let me think of this, you've got these studies like Schoenfeld studies. There's also other studies that are short-term studies where there's massive amounts of volume that these subjects were able to undergo. One of them was um, twice a week, hmm. eight sets of in the highest volume group, and there was no sign at this volume um, level or this this condition, there was there was still greater hypertrophy than at the at the lower volume level and the and the even lowest low volume level. And, the, and at the higher volume level of training, the training was twice a week, eight sets of knee extensions to failure and eight sets of squats to failure. Okay, can you imagine? Like regardless, at any time at your peak, whenever you were the healthiest and strongest. And most able to recover going in on Monday and doing 12 sets and eight sets of knee extension to failure and then eight sets of squat to failure and coming back and doing that again on a Thursday and doing that for 12 weeks. That's a lot. Yeah, that's <gasps> a lot. And what did you say but they found these, with that? They, it was a, they found a dose response that, that was an inverted U. So I can't remember exactly the numbers, but um, – that was the highest volume, and the other, other, the 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 next that was sixteen sets for the for the quads, and I think the next lowest was maybe um, twelve, and then six, okay. something like that. Yeah. 
um, or maybe it was maybe it was ten, and I can't remember. But they that was the highest volume, and they saw basically a graded degree of muscle growth from the lowest to the medium to the highest level of volume. Hmm. So I'm a mat. So you see that there's no law of diminishing returns there that was evidenced by that particular study. Yeah. Lower volume, they got X amount of growth. More volume, they got more growth. Highest volume, eight that eight sets and eight sets, sixteen sets. Yeah, um, it was thirty-two sets a week. Sorry, I take that back. Right, hmm. so sixteen sets twice a week. Right, right. Just crazy amount of volume. Like that's 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 not possible for someone who really trains to failure. Yeah. Um, the no, way Mike happy. would have someone train. Yeah. 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 Just so. It's interesting. He probably would just say, well, that research is bullshit. Well, I don't think they made up those numbers. Yeah. I think what, what happens what happens there, and this is why one way in which volume training can work, is that in those situations, there has to be some, I call it sandbagging. There has to see be, to some degree, and some there may be some individuals who could somehow recover from that, right? Yeah. But there has to be some recognition that, holy shit, I've got I've to endure – all these sets. Yeah. So they're leaving some, they're leaving some reps in reserve. Yeah. They have to be you know, after that third set of going to like absolute failure. There's no way you're going to do five more on the squat, you know? Yeah. It's just like, that's just an impossible possibility. So, um, but that's the interesting thing. If people are not willing to train to failure mm-hmm. and I'm just, they did according to the study, they trained to failure, but if people, Engage in a higher volume training regime, maybe because they like that. They like to be in the gym. They like to get the pump or what have you. Yeah. More can be better to some degree. Yeah. Or, so or maybe not even if they, it's maybe what if they can't, you know, what if you're in a position where you can't train to failure? Like if your central nervous system had gotten completely wrecked from having gotten the bug and you still want to be able to train mm-hmm. and being able to like for me taking it to absolute failure would then wreck my entire week after that trying to like s- like recover from that you know it's just like all sorts of brain fog and all of that but i can not go to failure and do more reps so you know there are, there i think there's a mm-hmm. lot of reasons or say somebody with like a back issue maybe they can't squat to the point where they almost f- take it off the tracks you know what i mean but they can go with a, right. a, a lighter weight reps in reserve and, and still do more sets to make up for that. Does it? Yeah. And it's I, still a stimulus. Yeah. Obviously it still yeah. produces more growth in dose response fashion. So the thing that I, I sort of drive at just to kind of finish off the important um, part of this really is that what I think, and this is where I would agree with Mentor, I think um, don't know for sure is that, from the evidence I'm able to find and they don't, they don't, the evidence is the data are there. It just doesn't get published. And I've asked a couple of times for, for folks to bring this out is that my thought is that we've got an adapt, we've got, it's an adaptive response, right? There's some adaptation to this overload. And if you're doing high reps, which is endurance oriented, you're going to have some adaptation, which is not going to necessarily manifest as strength. You don't see strength gains in those high rep studies. You know, maybe some, but it's minimal. You see the strength gains when people train with heavier weights. You see the best strength gains when powerlifters train and they're trying to improve their strength. So the mm-hmm. adaptation is specific. And my thought is that if the adaptation of hypertrophy is meaningful for the overall adaptation to the type of training that you're doing, you're going to see the best hypertrophic gains, the best muscle mass gains in those individuals whose performance in that mode of training, let's call it, in the high volume, um, lower rest interval, if you're doing it that way, you're going to see the best performance and gains go alongside the best growth gains. And if you're training like a Mike Menser in person, if you double your, with the course of a year, um, you double your squat and you double your bench or what have you, or add 50% versus someone who has half those gains in strength, you're going to tend to see lesser gains in size with the lesser gains in strength because strength is more specific or at least look at your eight to 10 rep max. So I think form follows function to some degree. And the thing I think that Mike, Mike's take on it was always that the function that produces the best gains in form Mm. is the function of training to failure with heavy, heavy weights as opposed to not training to failure with a higher volume approach, which 
I, I suspect also, and I'm waiting for, you know, because the thing is with these studies, they're doing progressive overload. It's in the methodology. They're, they're tracking the loads that are used and they're incrementally upping those every week, every two weeks to ensure a progressive overload. So the data are there. Yeah. All you got to do is take those data that you've written down and used to construct the training program and say, okay, how much growth did we get in, in these subjects versus how much did they improve in their weights from beginning to the end? or rates, rates times reps, reps, whatever you want to do to quantify it. But they're not publishing that. And that is like, oh, my God, come on, come on. This needs to happen, right? Yeah. It's so, it's so vital. Like, if we're to know what we can, like, the, the thing that is so important that I think it gets missed in a lot of these studies is, like, what, what, what do you tell in the real world someone who's, wanting to put on muscle size or let's say you want to have more muscle size that would hopefully carry over in a situation like with an older person so that they have a less likelihood of fracturing your hip when they fall or that they can use that size when they're out hiking or anytime when you need more muscle mass right mm -hmm. just in general that you can gauge in other activities what do you tell them like what are we shooting for well you're shooting for exactly what mike is saying you don't do things that are that are easily within your realm of abilities you do things that that are that stress you that 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 lead you to getting better at whatever type of training you're doing heavy to failure or higher volume with lower loads and more sets and we see that there's there's there there are there is evidence like long term like there's a two year study with rugby players where you see this nice correlation between strength gains and and lean body mass gains hmm. um, but there's some people who make lean body mass gains without any strength gains. There's like the individual sure. data there. And there are some people who make great strength gains and don't have any lean body mass gains. Yeah. And some of that's probably nutrition, obviously. Yeah. That could I easily be a factor. Can, you can get stronger and, but if you don't eat enough, you're not, you're not supplying the nutrients and the hormonal stimulus with insulin, what have you to, to make the, make the gains in muscle size. But anyway, all right. Yeah, there's a little diatribe. <laughs> Hundred percent of your momentary muscular ability, audience, is the single most important factor in increasing strength and size. Working to a point of momentary muscular failure, where another rep is impossible despite your greatest effort, ensures that you pass through the breakover point, or that point in the set below which you go and growth will not be stimulated, and above which you grow and growth will be stimulated. Interesting to note here, even the detractors of high intensity training force theory have to admit that the last rep of a set is the most productive. Think about it. The, all these people, many of them knuckleheads, <laughs> who claim high intensity training theory is buff. Now what's the first principle of the theory of high intensity training? The principle of intensity. When they say high intensity doesn't work, there's no validity. That's like saying the first rep is better than the last. So if you can curl 100 pounds for 10 reps, just do one rep. Forget the last nine. Because intensity doesn't matter. Come on. Yeah, pause there. Yeah, that, so there's there's actually, I think that Togo is the name of the first author. It's a Japanese study. I mentioned it in my Fortitude, Fortitude training book. Where they just clearly kind of did this. They took... It was something like this. This isn't the exact format, but they basically took, um, I think they had two groups. Maybe they did a one-sided training. But anyway, the comparison was something like three sets of 10 to failure versus six sets of five with okay. the same load, right? Didn't get any muscle growth in the six sets of five. Really? It was just, the workload was the same. Yeah. No but kidding. It was the same load. So you took the three sets of 10. Yeah. Let's say, you know, whatever, you're doing an incline press. And you're, you use two and a quarter and 205 and 185. You know, you're getting sets of 10 roughly as your fatigue. So then they took those same loads and you have to be like, I think it was maybe it was a one arm. I can't remember. It was maybe one legged study. So you, you take take those same loads and then you just, instead of doing, trying to take sets to failure, you just do sets of five with a rest interval in there. So you never get close to failure. Hmm. So you tally up the reps, but he's calling intensity effort here. Right. Yeah. So you never have any effortful reps because you take that set, you take that 200 pound load that you could do for 10 and you just do five. Yeah. And then they rested like a minute and they did five more. Right. 
So huh. they were always like like literally like five five reps in reserve in the example I'm coming up. It was a similar design. Interesting. Of course. Yeah. And that makes total sense, right? Like it, it, there's not a, it's not a stress. It's not a it's not there's no stimulus there. So this is like that's a, it's an old study too. It's been around for a while, but it supports exactly what he's getting at. The first rep and the the rep previous to failure simply are not the same in terms of stimulus. That's the whole idea of effective reps. Hmm. And there's a nice study out there that that did that. That's um, great. Yeah. I had a client of mine. He's now a good a client. I was telling Brian this earlier. He called me several months ago. He was in a quandary. He said, Mike, I don't know. I'm awfully confused. I don't know if I should sign up with you or Charles Pollockin. Uh, his name is Mac. I, I said, Mac, if, you, if, if you're that confused and you can't see on the face of it the difference between Charles Pollockin and I, I really don't want you to sign up with him. You deserve each other. <laughs> Anybody oh who denies, this is the point. All the semi jokes. I love to hear what Charles about that. But yeah. Yeah. If you believe that the first rep of a set to failure is better than the last rep of a set, you're either so stupid that you don't deserve my presence, as Arthur Jones used to say, <laughs> or you just got something very wrong with you. Obviously, wow. the last rep of a set to failure is the most productive. Now, there have been a few individuals, not necessarily high-intensity advocates, who have raised the intelligent question. I'm not saying everybody who's against high-intensity has no intelligence. They're just on their developmental way to finally embracing this. <laughs> and I mean pause, that pause there. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting... Um, and this is just sort of my armchair psychology perspective on this. Okay. Is that the um, the acolytes of HIT, there is a certain camp of people who are like, this is it. Like there's, it's black and white. This is the way, this is sort of, at least this is the reputation I've seen. I haven't, I haven't read the boards or literally um, interacted with anyone. I know of some folks like this, but there's a kind of a camp, let's say. Yeah. And their re their reputation, at least, and I saw a bit of this, but it's been a while since I um, witnessed it, any of it for a while. So maybe it's not as, as bad as it seemed like it once was. Is literally like our way or the highway. Yeah. And it was in that sense, it was very you could say elitist. Like, oh, yeah. we know, but you don't effing know because you're a dumbass. Basically, yeah. the sort of thing. And Mike, like the way he presents himself there. The thing that's interesting, I think, this is the, this is my thought on this, is that his way of presenting his ideas is going to appeal with someone who has an affinity for that type of a mindset. Ah, uh, right. Yes, yes. Who, who would like like to know that they've got the answer, um, because it's a very clarifying thing to have. Like it's mm -hmm. it's. I mean, like anybody, especially now, who's just starting out and trying to figure out which way is up. Right. Like, how should I train? Who should like who should I pay attention? Charles Poliquin or or Mike Menser, like the way that he's even the way he says that, and he's sort of you know puts Pollockin down. It's like there's a cult of personality that some people are attracted to behind that way of, of mm -hmm. behaving, presenting your ideas. So he could he could very easily you know like take let's say he took the idea that the everyday events that we're accustomed to are things that don't require repeated continuous persistent effort at a very high level. There's almost nothing that you do. Even if you look at construction workers who are out, they take breaks, they avoid fatigue. Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't see heavily, many heavily muscled construction workers like you do the most heavily muscled bodybuilders in the world, almost all of whom train with high volume. I'm being, I'm doing, I'm taking like a Mensarian way of approaching this, you know, yeah, sort of my yeah. the way. And so it's it's that repeated exposure to high effort levels <laughs> of a volume that amount of volume that produces an overload to which the body is not accustomed that leads the body <laughs> to produce this hypertrophic adaptation. And if you can't understand that notion, then you don't deserve to be in my presence, or, yeah. as Arthur Jones used to say, or as Ronnie Coleman used to say, or, or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Ronnie would never say that, of course. Right. So. But the, his way of presenting things appeals to uh, 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 sort of your gut instinct to a certain degree. It appeals to certain people's desire to see things in a black and white fashion because yeah. he says it with such an authoritative and strong tone. 
Yeah. Um, it does. It sorts it out. It sorts it out. It makes <laughs> things simplified. And that's, I think, one of the, that, that's what we talked about in the last episode with the rat studies, that rat studies mm. are all bunk, that they're complete Throw garbage. Out, right? Because, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's a lot more complicated to think of things in a, in, in a series of gray tones versus just black and white. I was shocked mm-hmm. to hear the opposite um, a couple of years ago when you and I started talking a lot about uh, high intensity training. And I, I was so happy to put a video out about that and, and share some stuff that I discovered about training. And we were met by people who were anti hit people who uh. came on the channel and said, hit doesn't do anything. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, it, yeah, right. high intensity training just doesn't work. Period, and it was interesting to see the the camps on both sides. You know, the, mm-hmm. that there could be. And I love you said at the beginning of this. There's there's the levers, you know, and I think that those levers yeah. are constantly in need of adjustment. What worked really great for me two years ago isn't what works really great for me now. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in just to just to support Mensur, I don't. I don't. He's. I don't think he's a shyster. I don't think. No. I mean, the way he's presenting either. this now. I mean, I. I think he. He sort of things transformed over the course of time. And this is older. It says this is ninety eight. This is older. So yeah. This would have been I, toward the end. I think. You know, later on. I think he. He truly, honestly, sort of. Belie- he does believe what he's saying, and he's. He's saying it because he's got a true and honest conviction, not like he's trying to, like, present himself in a way that, let's say maybe a dishonest cult leader would in order to attract people who, who would have a natural affinity to follow people who are sort of absolutists like that. The yeah. other thing that you made me, maybe um, that's interesting too, that made me think of was, is that hit had, it changed over the course of time. And from what I, right. what I remember, cause I've been around for a, a hot minute too. Remember reading and when Menser was still alive is that he had like, kind of gone off the deep end people were saying because he was talking about like one set every two or three or four weeks like one set a month and yeah. um it got to be too extreme and that wasn't what he was always so there's so he what what hit means may vary that has to be sort of defined if you're going to say that hit you know high intensity training mincer doesn't work it's like well that can't like you, like what are you talking about first of all and if of course, there's all sorts of people who he looked pretty damn good. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he was he arguably could have won an Olympia with his physique. Yeah. So, and I just looked it up. Have. So he died in June 10th, 2001. So this is like three years before that. This is right at the end. Then you know. Okay. All right. All right. Let's hear what else he has to say. A few individuals have raised the intelligent question as to whether it is actually necessary to train to failure. They say, Mike, how do you know for sure that 100% intensity of effort is absolutely required to stimulate growth? Maybe it's only 60% or 82 or 91. It's a good question. How do we know? Well, the problem here, audience, would be be one in measuring intensity. There are, in fact, only two perfectly accurate measures of intensity. Zero percent when you're totally at rest (laughs) and a hundred percent intensity when you're exerting yourself with maximum effort. So long. That's kind of a good point that you you know what zero is and you know what a hundred is. Those are very definitive. Yes. Answers. You know what I'm saying? Right. So he, from, as I understand it, in the traditional, and this is sort of morphed to over the last few years, which I'm, I think is unfortunate because it didn't need to be so. Um, but until maybe the last five, 10 years, intensity in the exercise science literature meant a relative percentage of a one repetition maximum okay, or percentage of a maximal voluntary contraction. So intensity was relative to a maximal effort, a, a given load, we're given percentage of that load at maximal effort, a one rep max, a dynamic, or an isometric contraction. Could even be an eccentric if you wanted to. You could quantify that, but typically a one rep max or MDC. And then intensity in the lay bodybuilding term is is effort, effort level. And 
he's if I if I recall what he said, there's only two ways to accurately yeah measure intensity, meaning effort. Yeah, right. Does that? I think that's how he that's, said it. That's what I'm getting from it. Yeah. Yeah. So accuracy of a psychological phenomenon is a very interesting comp, com, um, um, measurement to make. It's a very interesting concept. Okay. Right? Because what he's talking about doing is using an external performance measurement um, as an indicator of 100% effort. So right, failure right. means that you're – that your subjective effort level is 100%, right? Right. Um, and I would agree that like, if if someone is truly at 100% effort, um, and there's some issues there too, and then they fail, then you've got a two, two, two concepts or two measurements, percent effort, which someone would, could validate as saying or, or respond as saying it's 100%, and failure because they – couldn't get any, couldn't do any more. Um, but you can, of course, measure RPE. And that was, had been done long before, you know, um, this talk was made. And you can estimate reps in reserve. Um, and those don't correspond. And actually, the cool thing is we, we know what we can, we can back up what he's saying there, especially with newbies, when they are asked to, asked to guesstimate their reps in reserve, uh-huh. and they say three or four, and yeah. then you push them to failure, they're way off. Yeah. So they have a very inaccurate um, psychological perception of the true performance reserve that they have. Yeah. But here's the thing, and this is the sort of the nuance of this. And I'm not a psychologist, but I'll see if I can if I can make sense of my understanding of this. Okay. Express my express it in a way that makes sense at least. Is a psychological perception is a psychological perception. It's like like saying, "Ouch, that hurts," and you're saying, "Well, no, it doesn't." It's like. <laughs> It's my mind. It's my perception. And when someone says, you know, how much does that hurt on a scale from one to ten? And you say, if, and they say seven, you can't say, well, you're wrong. That's their perception in that moment. Yeah. Um, so that's just their psychological perception. It is a subjective measurement. It all yes. is a matter of how they subjectively perceive that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, in terms of. In terms of having a hundred percent effort and that lining up with failure, that certainly makes sense. Yeah, because um, there's like a difference between your psychological perception and the mechanical ability of your body. Right, and what of course changes over time is what you perceive to be a hundred percent. Yeah, it sure right? as hell does. Yeah, and you know, in one in one sense too. I mean, just to this to kind of invalidate the 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 association that he's making the equivalency that he's drawing between 100 percent effort and muscular failure is that you can there's all sorts of beyond failure techniques you start yeah. doing you know four straps let's say you do do four straps um and control negatives and then you and then and then you do you know four straps and and even and then add assistance so someone can still do a controlled negative like you can go many reps beyond failure and your effort level is going to be higher than it what was when you met that reached that failure point. Yeah. Right. And two, and you probably know it, like failure for um, um, the biceps or the triceps or what have you, a small muscle group, in terms of percent effort, um, on a, in an absolute sense, is not going to be as much as it is on a squat. Right. Yeah. You take a and here and 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 then it's also going to differ depending on the load, because. You're in, and I'm talking about intensity now. I'm using the word effort because to differentiate that from intensity as a percent one rep max. So I'm, when I say effort, I mean what Menser means is, is intensity. So the effort it takes to do a Widowmaker with squats, so the intensity at the end of that um, is going to be different than if you did a straight set with continuous reps with a unilateral biceps curl. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You bang it out, all of a sudden, like, I can't get any more with good forms. Like, okay, that was... Is that 100% intensity? Well, relative to the exercise, yes. Relative to what you're capable of, no. Hmm. So I get what he's getting at, but this is this is the thing. Just speaking from from a scientific perspective, and I've done I've done subjective measurements in terms of pain and RPEs and those sorts of things. Um, 
exercise psychology is a really, a really tricky area hmm. in terms of measuring RPE and reps and reserve and those sorts of things. Um, because effort level, it's not as if the 100% is going to absolutely have to correspond exactly when you reach failure because it's a subjective measurement. And it could be, I, if I reached failure, if I did like a set of bicep, bicep curls and took it to failure and you say, what was your RPE? And I would say, and 10, 10 is like maximal effort that you can possibly imagine doing the hardest exercise you've ever done in your entire life. Right. Okay. That's your 10. And you yeah. do a set of biceps curls to failure. It's like, that's a six, maybe. Yeah. I, I couldn't get any more reps. I reached failure. But that was an RP of 10. <clears throat> Not even close. Hmm. So, so yeah, like speaking as, as a, from a scientist of what he's saying, it totally makes sense for the layperson. The concept is is valid and it's it's very helpful from an instructive standpoint. But from a scientific standpoint, um, I think there's some holes in trying to make that equivalency between intensity or effort and failure because, um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily match up for the ways I just mentioned. Here's the point. So long as you are exerting yourself with 100% intensity of effort, you will have passed through every possible breakover point. 62%, 79, 84, 93. <laughs> as long as you go to 100, you pass through every possible growth stimulation point, you see. That's why we keep stressing trains to failure. It's not going to hurt you. Pause there. Not that's, that's interesting. I'm trying to like, I don't know his philosophy in depth. I haven't, I have one of the videos and I think I maybe started reading one of the books once, but um, he seems to say there's, there's gr growth. What do we call them? Growth stimulation points. Like you mentioned those, throughout those percentages. Mm -hmm. and that seemed like he was suggesting that there are, points in the set that actually are stimul stimulating for growth, just not to the same extent as if you go to failure. I, I think he was saying that you're going to cover all your bases. That okay. if you, if you, if you get to that 61%, if you go to a hundred, then you're going to cover 61 and 75 and 83. I think that's what he was saying. But those are, those are breakover points. Like, so at 83, there's a breakover point for stimulate. If you can scroll back. Yeah. A little yeah. Bit, yeah. Let's Maybe, go yeah. back just a little bit here. Hold on a second. I don't know how far I needed to go. Through every possible breakover point. Totally at rest. And 100% intensity when you're exerting yourself with maximum effort. So long, here's the point. So long as you are exerting yourself with 100% intensity of effort, you will have passed through every possible breakover point. 62%. 79, 84, 93. As long as you go to 100, you pass through every possible growth stimulation point, you see. Yeah, that that's there. that's what I, I'm getting from him, is that I think he's... I it, Tell me if I'm wrong or if you think it's different, but I, I'm gathering that, let's say that, you know, somebody were to think that you were to make great growth at, you know, 80%. Well, if you get to 100, then you, you did do 80. You covered that. You covered all your bases mm -hmm. by getting to 100 I think that's what he was saying. Does that sound right? Yeah, that that that's that's kind of like that. That's a valid way to interpret it. What I understood, he called those growth stimulation points. Yeah, that was the last term that he used. As yeah. if there is a breakover point or a growth stimulation point that occurs at ninety-one percent or whatever, whichever number he used. Right. I think. Yeah, okay. So let me develop this. Yeah. If maybe yeah, yeah. I mean who knows? Because I don't understand exactly how, what. But that seems to suggest. I wouldn't have called those growth stimulation points if the idea is that you don't get growth stimulation unless you reach failure. That would suggest that if you go to 91%, which is a rep or two shy, there is some growth stimulation that comes from that. <laughs> well, right? Well, we I, call it a growth yeah. stimulation point. Yeah. Hold I on. Think, so yeah, then, okay, so okay. let's say you do three sets and go to 100%. Yeah. And right. you Like what you said, like that's – then you got three sets. It's more efficient, right? You got all yes. – everything that you got from 50, 63 and 87 or whatever it was. Yeah. And you got it all in three sets. But let's say in your like in your situation now compared to two years ago, yeah. there's a growth stimulation point that happens at 91 or 93. Then you just have to do five sets to cover those bases, <laughs> right? Because you're just you're, you're you're it's like it's like you're getting Easter eggs, you know, along you the set. Your basket, your growth <laughs> stimulation points, right? 
<laughs> and you can get all five of them, right? All five effective reps. We're not going to use that, yeah, that sure. um, paradigm. If you take a set to failure, or you can just gather three by doing a few extra sets, three per set, and then you just have to do a couple extra sets. You want to get 15, you do three sets of two sets to failure, <clears throat> or you can do five sets where you just get three Easter eggs, you know, by going to whatever <laughs> breakover point, stimulation point, right? But he kind of contradicts himself there a little bit. And with the, those sound like, those are cool terminate, ter, it's cool terminology, you know? Like, yeah. And you see there's like in, you'll see in, when you look at plots, like regression lines and those sorts of things, there's something called, an, you can look for inflection points. Okay. Where the curvature of the line changes from, um, in a way that you can statistically note, or you can literally just see these things. Yeah. So he's calling it like a breakover point, like like something goes up, like and then there's a breakover. Don't know quite what that means, but that suggests that there's something to be had at that ninety one percent, whatever it might be. Yeah, I and think he called it a gross stimulation point. Yeah, yeah he did use that term, and I don't know if maybe he was just trying to sound big or something, but he said what was that? It was just a little bit before that. I think if I went back a little bit further question as to whether it is actually necessary to train to failure. They say, Mike, how do you know for sure that 100% intensity of effort is absolutely required to stimulate growth? Maybe it's only 60% or 82 or 91. And I think he's saying, well, guess what? If you go to 100, you covered 60 and 91 and all that. I think that's, right. that's that, where he's going and that. And that makes that. sense. But but he but he does say if you let it play he does say okay. that ninety one is a gross stimulation point. <laughs> it's a good question. How do we know? Well, the problem here, audience, would be in what be one in measuring intensity. There are in fact only two perfectly accurate measures of intensity: zero percent when you're totally at rest. And 100% intensity when you're exerting yourself with maximum effort. I see where you're going with this now. I see what you're saying. So long, Here's the point. So long as you are exerting yourself with 100% intensity of effort, <laughs> you will have passed through every possible breakover point. 62%, 79, 84, 93. As long as you go to 100, you pass through every possible growth stimulation point. I see what you're saying now. I see what you're saying now. Right. It's just, you're just gathering those like, might as well get them all in one fell swoop, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. But but he's, it's kind of suggests that you get some along the way, you know? So I wish that would be a great I, one. If you were in the audience, you could raise your hand so and ask him right. about that, you know? I mean, that's what I might say. So I, I, I think he said 93% in that. Yeah. He may have said 91 previously, but. It's like, so, so Mike, you know, what is the, for someone who, you know, for safety reasons or, um, you know, let's say have a respiratory limitation, they yeah. just simply can't go to a hundred percent intensity. Can they gather together gross stimulation points? Easter eggs. Um, by and doing, by doing more sets <laughs> and not going to failure. I mean, cause he's literally like, he's, he's like, literally he's really in that last clip, and it could be just like he just sort of may have misspoke to some degree, but he's talking about what we now commonly refer to as the effective reps paradigm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's not like 60, 61%. I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, the six rep of a 10 rep set or when your RP is six, like that's not going to be effective necessarily. But in the 80s and 90s where your RP would be eight or nine, yeah, he's talking about breakover points, and that's uh, that's his own terminology. I don't. I've never heard that. I don't really know what, exactly what he means he means by that. Yeah. But um. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. All right. What does he have to say for us? Point, you see. That's why we keep stressing train to failure. It's not going to hurt you. Not only is it desirable, it's absolutely necessary so that you know you stimulate a growth. Does that help anybody? I see where you're going with that now, Scott. Most of you know this already. Yeah. No, yeah, press, um, it's press new material. There. Some of this. So, so that's the interesting thing. I mean, there's another thought there. I could, I, I could, like every sentence I can like I have something to say. The thing that's interesting in the context of this in 2001 is that there was, I mean, this was 2001, right? 90, 98. He, he passed away Nin, in 2001. 98. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is 98. Um, is that the year Ronnie won the first Olympia? 98. Yeah. Look that up. Was it but, 99? It was right around there. And anyway, 
we had Dorian Yates, you know, he's just, so he's on the tail end of Dorian Yates career. Yeah. But then we had Ronnie Coleman, you know, um, and you know, Ronnie trained hard, but you don't, you don't see this, you know, and Ronnie was used a little body English, but you don't see like these, these grinding reps where Ronnie's going to failure. 98. 98. That's what I was thinking. So, um, and this may have been before after Ronnie won, <laughs> but, um, but it's but training the failure is not the only way you know you stimulate growth. Aside from all that, first of all, there's all these other bodybuilders who've done really really well stimulating growth without training the failure, like Jay Cutler. Um, and then you know you can also you can also track. Let's say if you, if you are consistent in your intensity, leaving one or two reps in reserve or what have you, um, and you're tracking your progress in the gym. And you're watching your your and you're and you're tracking your body composition. And you're using the mirror yeah. and the scale. Those are other ways to know if you're making progress. Absolutely. So it's but in the you know microscopically in training, and I, this is why I include failure sets in fortitude training. If you're looking looking to be ensure that you've got some form of progressive overload, pick the exercises that lend themselves best to taking. You know, six to twelve rep sets, those loading sets in order to training to a failure point, or look at the loading sets themselves and see where you're progressing there. Just like DC training, yeah, it's very much progressive overload. So, so you know you're going the right direction. Yes, right. But it's yeah. not the only way. It's not the only metric. Yeah. There's many, many others. But this is this is where I think people people want to, you know, dig in and sort of nail Mencer to the cross because he was so unidimensional in this failure notion of failure, you know? Yeah. He was, you know, this was, it was his way or the highway there. And he's, he doesn't step in and see, you know, the other ways, other ways that you can like, just in that, in that statement itself, it's very black and white. Um, yeah. and the evidence is against it. There's plenty of bodybuilders who don't train failure who, who were pretty damn big. Yeah. You know? I think though, you know what, part of that might've been, if we looked at like the, um, if we looked at the social climate of when he came into the picture, that mm. the 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 opposite was the only way, you know, the weeder the weeder principles, you know, that that, he, that yeah, and that he was highly speaking out against that. So it kind of I think for him became a crusade, and probably the the because of that social context had to dig his heels in even deeper, you know, because mm -hmm. he's, he's arguing for the fact that, you know, I, I think what, what do you think the problem is, Scott? Do you think it, in, with our society, and I guess this is uh, our community bodybuilding, what is the bigger problem? And this is, a, I guess, an opinion question is it, that, that people are doing too much volume and not going to failure or that they're not doing enough volume and, and, and just going to failure. I think that, you know, a lot of times we, we aren't giving enough intensity. The intensity, is it that we often have too much intensity or often have not enough? So I think that he's maybe trying right. to swing that pendulum toward intensity and he, he's taking a really extreme stance to do that, you know? Yeah. And I mean, the thing that is going to support his efforts and support the results of the people that, that do take his, take his tact on thing. They take, they take an HIT approach yeah. is if you truly believe in it, you know, you're not just like, Oh shit, I'm going to give this or give this an eight week whirl, but I don't really expect it to do much. Yeah. You can't have that men You can't yeah. have that mentality and go into the gym and train in this way and really go to failure. You have to like, Put your will in motion that I am going to get. I mean, I'm thinking DC training now in particular, but I'm going to failure and I'm going to do more than I've ever done before. Yeah. He's talking about that. I don't know how much he was big on log booking and those sorts of things um, and, and, you know, quantifying the progressive overload in terms of performance in the gym. But you can't just, you know, say, I'm just going to go in here and, you know, just kind of, you know, get a good pump and then do a bunch of sets and get out of the gym and get my workout in. Yeah. Not with this way of training. So you have to, there has to be some conviction and a true inner belief. And if that's the case, I think if you take someone who just come hell or high water, they're going to go to failure and yeah. they're going to, they're going to just decimate themselves every workout with appropriate volume, of course. Um, and they, they need to believe in that and then that'll make it happen. Hmm. I mean, it, it's, it simply will. If you set someone to task for five years and hypnotize them, yeah. And said, hey, you got five years to, you know, triple all your major lifts in terms of the weight you're using from beginner to, 
to that intermediate advanced level and they got there, that would happen. They would do everything else perfectly. Yeah. So there's got to be kind of a belief in it. Um, Speak of the devil, Kuba Chellen's with <laughs> us. <laughs> he, he'd probably uh, he'd probably relate he to that, you know, a guy who has yeah. used a lot of high intensity to be able to get his physique yep. where it is. Yeah. So I think I think the thing people just kind of get back to your question is I think program hopping is still an issue. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and I think behind that is looking for to a lot of to a certain degrees looking for an easier way. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a there's a there's a intelligent an intelligent approach is finding the right kind of volume and the right way of training that works for you. Absolutely. But it's human nature to seek out the easiest way to get from point A to point B. Hmm. And a lot of times, I mean, the, it, I would say if I had if I had to choose one or the other, not that I like you know black or white decisions necessarily because that doesn't necessarily. But to illustrate this point, I think it makes sense to we can frame it in this way. Yeah. Is if I had to pick, um, do I look for the hardest way or do I look for the easiest way? Yeah. I'm going to pick the hardest way hmm. um, because you're trying in the general sense, you're trying to evoke an adaptation. Um, that is something that is, is your body is going to receive as an absolute ultimatum for producing an adaptation. Hmm. And that could be training like Jay Cutler. That could be training. Um, and I, and I even say this in one of my, one of my talks, one of the kind of the bottom lines, um, a lot of times for many people in finding solutions to bring up weak muscle groups or to produce growth when they've, they've seen like run up against a wall. It's like, what haven't you done? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard, you know, or that's, that's substantially different, but that, you know, at least for some people is a hypertrophic response. This doesn't say like, you know, take up marathon running. Well, that's going to be hard, but it's not necessarily <laughs> going to be a good adaptation. Right. Um, but, you know, figure out like, okay, I haven't tried to do like FST seven, let's say, like, I think, I think that's totally foo-foo. I'm not saying this per se, but someone said, I think that's foo-foo because it never worked. What's got me here is DC training during the eight style training, HIT, et cetera, et cetera. But if now you're at, if you're at your end point, you're not going anywhere to something else that's yeah. outside your wheelhouse. Yeah. You know, that's, but it would have to be hard. Generally, I mean, I'm not trying to pick on, on Mike, but like an example that falls into my head was, was Jordan Peters when he did a, a podcast, Steve Hall's um, Revive Stronger podcast with Mike Isretel. Okay. And Mike's take on things generally is a higher volume thing. Um, and you can train with reps and reserve. And his thought, you know, is that, um, that might be a solution for Jordan hmm. and Jordan very smartly. Jordan's not afraid of hard work. If the Denny was not afraid of hard work, <laughs> right? He thrives on that shit. Like that's, that's food for his, that's nourishment for his soul. Right. Yeah. But he took that on board and said, but he also wants progress. He's willing to do whatever it takes. Yeah. So if you're saying I, I need to stop walking on the hot coals yeah. and get over here to, you know, like the hot sidewalk, which isn't quite as, as difficult, but I'll, but if it'll mean that I'll make progress, I'll do it. He tried it. It didn't work for him. Hmm. Right. Wasn't his. So he's just, that's just one example. Not that that switch might not work for other people. Right. But for Jordan at his very advanced level. And this is supports given my his, general thought. Yeah. And given his current spot, maybe at another time. Yeah. Would, right. Is, is yeah. So there's, I think there's validity in shifting from maybe a, a lower, um, uh, a lower rep, lower set to maybe a higher, higher rep, higher set, or maybe a sorry, higher volume approach, but there's still going to have to be some amount of just effort and difficulty and stress yeah. in a way that challenges the individual. So it might be, okay, now we're going to do German, German volume training for legs. Hmm. And the person's used to not doing anything like that. Used to like doing the maybe they do one widow maker for DC training. Right. And that's their highest rep thing. But otherwise it's lower volume plenty of rest, beat every set, destroy the logbook. And now they try German volume training that yeah. can produce growth in people. And that's beastly difficult. Yeah. Right. So that's, I think the sort of the metric that is a good, not always the case. So some people just need to deload. Yeah. Right. Some people need to pull back a little bit. Maybe they're training too far because they're, they're in excess of the dose that they can recover from. Um, but the, the effective change in training perspective from, Going away from a mentor to more of an arm 
there still has to be some difficulty there. It can't just become, ah, oh, well, this is easy training unless the deload is necessary um, and expect that you're going to make progress. So yeah, it's not black or white. Sorry. wish it were, but Cuba said something similar. He said, we just love to train balls to the wall, man. Scott just nailed it on the program. Hopping is a massive issue because nobody wants to do the hard, I'll say stuff. Yeah. The fire gets hot and they just, ah, this is, I'm getting out of here. They try to jump over to the another pan. Pete. <laughs> Dr. Scott versus Mike Menser. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a, I would there's love a clickbait to be title. Around, man. It'd be so much fun to interact with him. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. He, he did, yeah. I think, share so much good stuff to help and swing that pendulum to that other direction, you know, to say, mm-hmm. hey, you know. It, it, at the same time, though, I think you still have to take it with just as much of a grain of salt as you do volume, you know, or anything yeah. and recognize, like you said, it's and that's we keep coming back to that same thing over and over and over, Scott, the gray areas that it's just not black and white. Yeah, he's a, he's a bookmark on sort of the end of the spectrum. He's like one yes. extreme. Yeah. And it wor- it does work for people. Yeah. Um, You know, there are people that train that way. Obviously, there's still, you know, if if eventually his way of doing things just was just complete hogwash. Then there wouldn't be people. We wouldn't be talking about it. Right. Yeah. yeah. It would um, continue to evolve. And uh, who knows if like DC training would have been there, you know, if, if everybody was just mm. doing volume and all the spinoffs that happened because of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't underestimate to what extent in your unconscious mind, you know, the things you've read or you've come across is influencing your ideas, you know? So obviously yeah. Dante was highly aware of Mike Menser. Yeah. Um, especially because people would always like that was one of the, like this is just HIT and Dante's like no it's, it's not yeah. but, not trying to like you know copycat um, Mike Menser right so yeah, it's good to have those have those bookmarks as a reflection because that's the contrast that we need to know anything right you don't know top from bottom unless you have top you don't know bottom if you don't have bottom you don't have top right yeah. Yeah. black white hot cold you need the contrast so he's sort of one end. Um, against which we can compare things. All right. Well, let's wrap this thing up, man. This is fun. This is, this is a blast. Actually. I had a fun time doing this with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. I like to just unleash my consciousness (laughs) like that. It was kind of cool. All right, guys. Well, if you want to hear more from Scott, go over to uh, byobbcoach.com. You can get his book there, Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach, or you can go to Amazon, get the hardcover there. I'll have links to both of those things in the description. Of course, check out our awesome sponsors. We mentioned Dante just now, True Nutrition, his company. Go to truenutrition.com. Use our code THINK for additional savings. Hit me up if you have any questions about any of their supplements. Supplementsource.ca for our Canadian folk. Got great deals that change week to week. Strom Sports Nutrition. If you're in the if you're in the UK, uh, lots of great health supplements there. And of course, thank you to everybody on Patreon. You guys are freaking awesome, stepping up to the plate. And uh, Victoria and I are going to do a uh, a live stream on Patreon soon. So stay tuned for that. Check out Patreon. We'll we'll have details for more of that stuff. Scott, as a pleasure, it's a pleasure as always, man. Thanks for doing this with me. Likewise, great idea, dude. Thanks for that, man. Cool. Thank you.